ready for the real thing. Cuttlefish like their meals alive. So does the size of a potential meal trigger these light shows? Well, it seems that for smaller prey or once they're well fed, they almost don't bother doing it. But with the bigger lures and the bigger crabs, the cuttlefish do a really good detailed display to sort of um, stun or to dazzle the prey long enough to slow them down. And then the cuttlefish could come in and nail them in the way it wanted to. In the case of the crabs, the cuttlefish wanted to grab it from behind so those big dangerous claws were out of the way of the attacker. It's all about positioning. If you don't want to lose one of your arms, you've got to get just the right grip on your prey. With his next offering, Mark gets an even better view of the show. The most interesting is when you offer a broad club cuttlefish a live animal in a glass jar. It gives you a perspective where you can move the jar around and see what it looks like from the prey's point of view. It looks like they're sort of effectively hypnotizing their prey. It's fantastic. They get very excited, come in and nail the glass, get confused, the water's solid and they can't get through the water and they continually try and get in at different angles on this glass containers. Every cuttlefish starts off with the same hungry determination, but Mark can't fool them for long. They learn really quickly. It only takes a few strikes before they realise they're not getting the crab, it's a total waste of time. You can sort of see them mentally turn off and sort of drift away. You get a sense there's a hell of a lot going on in those brains, but we're struggling to kind of understand how they work. As alien as they seem, cuttlefish do share something with us, big brains. While humans have one of the biggest brain-to-body ratios among mammals, Cuttlefish and octopus top the list for all invertebrates. Their large brains most likely evolved hand in hand with their complicated and changeable skin. There are up to 20 million of these pigment cells in the skin, and to control 20 million of anything is going to take a lot of processing power. And it has to have a large brain to make all this work. But does a big brain necessarily mean cuttlefish are intelligent? Looking for answers is Jess Purdy, a comparative psychologist at Southwestern University in Texas. Can we know more about ourselves by studying another animal? And as a comparative psychologist, I think we can by understanding their world a little bit can give us more insight into our world. But how do you measure an animal's brain power? The work with cuttlefish is at a very early stage. Not a lot of people have done learning experiments with cuttlefish. So we need to start at a very basic stage and then move up the ladder. Here at Southwestern, cuttlefish are being tested for the most basic levels of learning. For example, if you put a wind-up plastic fish into a cuttlefish tank, at first it mistakes it for food. But once it realizes how unappetizing the toy is, from then on, the cuttlefish will ignore it. But can you teach the cuttlefish that the toy has a different meaning? The experiment that we do with Troy the toy fish is actually asking that question. Okay, here we go. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, Sam. The experiment as you see it looks very simple. You see somebody simply drop a toy fish in and then a little bit later drop a fish in. One question is whether or not the cuttlefish can learn to associate the toy fish with the promise of food. Sure enough, 
If Troy the toy is consistently joined by a real fish, then the cuttlefish will pay close attention to him. But with a separate test group, Troy swims alone and no meal appears. So for those cuttlefish, Troy will hold absolutely no interest. So we're seeing a difference between these two groups and the difference is learning. Hydrophone check. Okay guys, we're ready to go here. The next step is to see if the animal can learn to do something in order to get fed. Like pressing a button on a vending machine or in their world, hitting a jar to receive a reward. It's an orienting response. Sound familiar? Remember when the Broad Club cuttlefish was shown crabs in a jar? After a few frustrated jabs, it quickly lost interest. But in this test, some cuttlefish are rewarded from an automated feeder. Strike the jar, get a snack. These cuttlefish quickly learn this trick and will keep hitting the jar. Cuttlefish easily master the most basic learning skills. So researchers need to come up with more difficult challenges if they want to really measure their brain power. Are cuttlefish intelligent? I'm absolutely convinced that they are. So where do we go from here? Is it the level of cognitive complexity that we think these animals are capable of? Have we seen how smart they are at this point? And I don't believe we have. For any creature, when it comes to intelligence, what matters most is how it helps you survive in the real world, so you can pass on your genes to a new generation. And there's one place where the wiliest cuttlefish play their most elaborate tricks. It's late May in southern Australia. Life on shore is just settling down for the winter. But beneath the waves, things are heating up. It's the mating season for the Australian giant cuttlefish, and thousands of them are swimming into the spawning grounds. Giant cuttlefish coming together to breed is the most dazzling shows that they can do in these colour and shape changes. And it's spectacular when you see them just come to life in these big displays. It's sort of like they rip off their um, Clark Kent outfit and out comes Superman or Super Cuttlefish. Giant cuttlefish can grow over three feet long. Eye to eye, the big males try to outdo each other with the most intimidating body patterns. The smaller females seem unimpressed. It's usually a very secretive behaviour in lots of other animals, including other cuttlefishes, and you're lucky to even come across breeding aggregations. But to see thousands of them here is just spectacular. And so for several months, they give up the pretense of looking like seaweed or hiding in amongst the sand or the mud, and they go, bugger it, we're just going to look fantastic and we're going to fight with each other and we're going to impress females, and they totally ignore us. We can sit in amongst them. They can almost sit on our head, and that's when the best displays come out. During mating, males outnumber the females, sometimes 10 to 1. And they're all looking for the chance to pass on their genes. While a female lays eggs beneath a rock, a big male tries to monopolize her, staving off the other hopeful suitors.
Sometimes intimidation alone won't work, and the competitors hurl themselves into a violent and bizarre looking wrestling match. Like an octopus, they'll squirt out an inky smoke screen when it's time for a hasty retreat. But size and strength aren't the only ways to impress the ladies. Thanks to the cuttlefish's skin morphing talents, the smaller males have a clever trick up their sleeve. The really interesting thing in this system is actually far less obvious. And when you first dive with them, you don't see it. It takes a while before you realize what's going on. The small males who have no chance in a contest with a big male are actually doing something completely different. They're effectively cross-dressing. They're dressing up as a female by pulling in their webs and putting on this mottled color pattern and gliding past these big aggressive males, pretending to be a female, and will come into the female underneath. And what happens is as another big male comes in and a potential conflict between these big guys starts up, the sneaker males start mating with her, successfully mate with the female, while the big guy isn't even aware of it. The cross-dresser's success is all the more impressive because the females often play hard to get, as Roger Hanlon has seen firsthand. These females are very picky. They reject 70% of approaches for mating, yet they only reject 30% of the cross-dressing males. So this trick gets them in the door, so to speak, past the fighting male, and they're accepted by the female. The little guy may have crossed one hurdle, but a female's welcoming embrace alone won't guarantee reproductive success. Mating in a cuttlefish is a strange affair. They go head to head, we call it. Then they join those eight arms together from each animal. Then the male has one special arm underneath in which he reaches back and he pulls out a packet of sperm. And then he just places that packet of sperm right up amidst the arms of the female. It's the male's job to hand over the sperm, but once he does, fertilization is up to the female. She's already mated with multiple partners and is storing their sperm in pouches under her arms. So now this female choosing this takes on a new dimension. She not only chooses mates during the day,